Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuhu. Bismillah. I begin in the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful, and I begin by sending praise and blessings upon his messenger, the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. Uh, I know it's been a while since we last had a chance to talk about our series and about walking alongside the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and I appreciate your patience as we work on catching back up uh, with our material. Inshallah, today we are looking forward to talking about some of the mannerisms of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We may have touched upon these in different ways, shapes or forms in the past and maybe in the future going forward, but just to highlight some distinctive aspects about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And again, to recap, we are going off of the compilation of the Shamail at tirmidhi um, I'm specifically using this book, which was published by the Imam Ghazali Institute, but uh, it's available online and in so many other uh, compilations and, and mediums. Uh, but as we were talking about last time, we had the chance to be able to come together and share a few of these narrations. We sat alongside the Prophet Sallallahu and we had a chance to see what his simple yet blessed lifestyle was like. Um, and today we'll look more at the peculiarities of the Prophet Sallallahu uh, specifically with respect to some of the notable mannerisms of which he, may, of which, like I said, we may have touched upon previously or that we'll see going forward, but things that he did that really distinguished him and which we can still benefit from in the here and now. And so uh, just to define, you know, in the sense mannerisms are, uh, you know, habitual or characteristic things uh, or modes or ways of doing something or distinctive qualities or styles um, like behaviors or uh, aspects of speech or whatnot um, that, that are uh, that are specific to a person. They don't have to be specific to a person, but um, they they uh, are just in these aspects, just things that, that that people do. And and so there's so many of these that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did that people would recognize that this was something that uh, is is distinguished about him. But then also in the aspect of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam being the uh, the model for all of humanity, being the Uswatun Hasana of all of humanity the blessed example, uh, these are things that we also seek to emulate and, 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 and try to model in certain ways. So <clears throat> to begin, uh, just to uh, run through some of these mannerisms and, and, and just to uh, give a little bit of background again, we how we go through these, uh, these topics and, and these broad strokes is uh, just to go through some of the hadith that are quoted um, about the Prophet Sallallahu with respect to these topics. So in the previous uh, sessions, we talked about the lifestyle of the Prophet Sallallahu or some of the characteristics, some of the appearances, and, and what is described of the Prophet Sallallahu or what is said in these narrations. And so today, we'll continue this, and we'll be sharing some narrations uh, that are all uh, kept within this book, within the Shema'il at tirmidhi and so they're all available there. Uh, but to kind of group them in this aspect of, of mannerisms. And we're going to use mannerisms in a fairly uh, generous um, understanding. And so it'll be fairly encompassing uh, from aspects of faith, from aspects of ritual worship, to aspects of uh, hygiene, to manners of speaking, all these different things. So without further ado, let us go ahead and begin. Bismillah. We start with the narration from uh, uh, Hassan ibn Ali radiallahu an that, uh, that that talked uh, with respect to how he had asked his aunt about the Prophet Sallallahu and had, uh, I believe, also asked his father about the Prophet Sallallahu and so had gotten a little bit more uh, of a holistic image of who the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was um, with respect to the gatherings of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and uh, in his, his appearance and, and all these different things. And so some of these hadith come from the, uh, those, those more detailed narrations. But to begin, uh, it was narrated that when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would turn or when he would go to look at somebody or something, that he would turn with his whole body. Again, just a mannerism type thing that when you would speak to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or when you would see him talking to somebody or if he has his attention diverted to something, he would give it his full attention. We're fairly accustomed in our times to just looking over our shoulder to just like pay attention, you know, haphazardly with respect to whatever may be asking our attention. So we may look to the left, to the right, um, but not fully uh, turning our whole uh, you know, our whole body towards a certain thing. And so the Prophet Sallallahu had this habit of, you know, giving his full undivided attention towards uh, whatever may be or whoever may be requesting his attention. 
the Prophet was also narrated as having lowered his gaze and looking at the ground more than he would look at the sky. Uh, so just again, a, a, a matter of speaking that if he's talking to somebody or if he's uh, in a conversation or if he's just, you know, in his own thought or looking around, he would more, more likely be uh, someone who is, is, is looking down, looking uh, just, you know, uh, in lowering his gaze as opposed to keeping his head up and, you know, looking up and looking out and around that it was a part of his modesty, it was a part of his humility to just to just lower his gaze, but not to take away at all from his attentiveness, that he would be uh, of the most attentive of creation, but he would be able to do so while still showing this aspect of humility that is just innate in it. He would also, what's really interesting, um, as, a, as a, one of his manners, he would have his companions walk in front of him, um, and he would initiate greetings of peace with whomever he met, as was related in this narration. So it's really interesting that he would have his companions walk in front of him, but he would also, you know, initiate greetings of peace of whoever came across them. But uh, when I was looking at the commentary of this hadith, uh, it was talking about how he would have those companions walk in front of him and he would have him, them walk to his right and to his left, but he would not have them walk behind him uh, as it was related that he disliked anybody treading over his footsteps or his footprints that were that were left behind, that he would like to have his the back part or the back of his uh, being um, left for the angels and for Allah to protect him. So it's a sign of having trust in Allah that he that Allah watches over him, that the angels are watching over him, and that he had that they have his back while he has the back of his companions. And uh, what what's also uh, interesting is that apart from standing behind or standing alongside his companions, so that he could watch them and he could walk with them and and go alongside, uh, that you have this aspect of him not liking people to kind of walk over his footsteps in a sense of just the, the the respect that is owed to a prophet, but in a sense of walking alongside. He didn't discourage anybody from saying that, hey, uh, I want to walk right beside you or I want to walk in front of you. Um, this is the same person that didn't like people to get up from them. So it wasn't anything about haughtiness or it wasn't anything about um, that I am this person and you can't uh, you know, come to this side and, and any sort of pride or ego. Um, it was just a matter of respect. And you see that this was a person, as we mentioned, who didn't want people to stand up for them, who didn't expect to have a seat at the table um, and would just find where they could sit. So just think about this is the same person in that psychology, walking with a group of companions and wanting them to walk in front of him, wanting them to walk to his left, to his right, so that he could see them, so that he could walk with them. Uh, and think about this in the sense of a shepherd. Uh, we know the Prophet ﷺ is very much, was a literal shepherd uh, growing up, but also he was a, a, a spiritual shepherd and shepherds lead from different places. Sometimes they're at the front, sometimes they're at the back, sometimes they're walking alongside, but their main focus is always care for those uh, in their flock, those in their congregation. And so thinking about the psychology of this, that uh, the Prophet would have this, uh, this habit of wanting his companions to walk in front of him or to his left, to his right, but thinking of it not uh, for any other reason, but for uh, his care for the companions and so that he could do, he could be with them as best and as presently as he could uh, and and to teach them a lesson while while, while doing it that it's uh, that that they should not be afraid to approach him in any aspect they shouldn't be afraid to be around him uh, and and also at the same time conveying a aspect of uh, religious significance with respect to faith that uh, he, no one had his back, but he trusted that Allah would be the one who watches over him, that the angels would be the ones who would watch over him. Uh, in another hadith, uh, Anas ibn Malik relates that the Prophet ﷺ would uh, frequently apply oil to his blessed hair and to his uh, to his head, and he would comb his blessed beard. So thinking about, he would do this frequently, he would do this regularly, but also from a mode of hygiene, that the Prophet would, uh, would would do various things to keep up his hygiene and encourage his companions to do so. But he was, uh, he was noted uh, for doing this very frequently with respect to oiling his hair, oiling his beard, and uh, keeping uh, these things clean. The uh, Prophet's wife Aisha relates as well that he liked to start from the right side in his purification when purifying, in his combing when he was combing, uh, and in his wearing of sandals when he would put them on. So also just thinking that this is a person who, apart from a religious injunction or example being given with respect to starting from the right, uh, an, a manner of his was just to always start from the right with respect to 
purifying himself with respect to combing, uh, with respect to putting on something or his sandals or pants or anything like that, um, whatever it may have been. But also uh, we talked about in the last time that when he would take off his sandals, he would start with the left one. But you, you, you see that there's this, this aspect of always wanting to start with the right side or with the right hand. And so uh, in another tradition, uh, Ikrima shares that the Prophet also had a coal container or um, you know, kind of like antimony uh, that's put on, but he had a coal container um, for which he would apply coal each night, um, three times in one eye and three times in the other. So again, um, taking care of oneself, like the, the Prophet some had advised uh, his companions to to put to to practice this for benefit of um, their eyesight and for other various benefits. But you see, the Prophet was mm -hmm. someone who also uh, was very attentive to and cared for his own body and cared for his own health. So uh, if you are to loop some of these mannerisms into or lump them into one kind of category, thinking of different ways the Prophet took care of himself, took care of the body that he's given because he knew that this body that he was given was an amana, was a trust from Allah. And so one of these mannerisms is just to upkeep it and, and treat it as best as one can. So oiling his beard, oiling his hair, doing whatever he can to make sure that he stays clean not so much for impressing other people, but also recognizing the rights that are due uh, to Allah and the, the praise and the gratitude that is due to Allah for what has been given. Abu Sa'id al-Khudri narrates that when the Prophet someone would put on a new garment or any uh, new article of clothing, that he would mention the name of the clothing or he mention its name, whether it's a uh, shirt or, uh, you know, if it's a uh, izahar or something that's worn like a loincloth or anything like that, that he would mention its name. And then he would say to it that, oh, Allah, to you is all praise. Or he would say about it that, uh, oh, Allah, to you is all praise for having clothed me in this and you know, using the article, I ask you of its good for which it was made, and uh, I seek refuge in you from the evil, uh, from its evil and the evil for which it was made. So again, just being very intentional. This was a strong mannerism of the Prophet ﷺ to just being intentional and to showing that intention uh, by giving thanks, giving constant praise, and 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 always keeping Allah. Uh, in the name of Allah and the praise of Allah at the forefront of the Prophet's, uh, uh, his, his speech and of his, his tongue and to, to keep this fresh on his, uh, on his thoughts. And so uh, always put whenever getting something or whenever putting something on or whatnot, having this aspect of, of giving praise for it, of making a dua for it. So having this, this mannerism of just continuing to uh, connect with prayer with respect to anything that comes into uh, one's life. It's reported that Najashi, the king of Abyssinia, the Negus had gifted the Prophet a pair, a solid pair of black leather footwear or socks, and he immediately put them on and performed ritual purification, and he wiped over them. And in another narration, Ihya uh, al-Kalbi gifted the Prophet a pair of leather boots, which he then wore until they tore. So this aspect that uh, a gift is given to the Prophet and he would immediately put it to use. He wouldn't just toss it to the side or whatnot. Like if, if it's something that is uh, is halal, if it's something that's good, if it's something that he can use and, and, and has no uh, other harm that's affiliated, that he would immediately be able to take it, put it to use, and and show his gratitude in that way, that he wouldn't waste it or wouldn't just hoard it or anything like that, that he would show his appreciation for these gifts by putting them to use. Abu Huraira relates that the Messenger of Allah said, let none of you walk while wearing a single sandal, either wear them both or remove them both. Uh, and Jabir ibn Abdullah uh, related that the Prophet Sallallahu forbade that one should eat with their left hand or walk only with one sandal. So you might think that, you know, what's with respect to one sandal that's, that's there, but seeing the Prophet had this manner to, to also conduct yourself kind of in a professional manner, conduct yourself appropriately that um, don't walk with just a single sandal. Don't, don't do anything incomplete uh, that this aspect of completeness was part and parcel of one's modus or how one operates in, in this world and how one goes about uh, about in their life, especially as a Muslim. And uh, in the and, and it's interesting to note that with respect to the sandal, there was commentary that when he would visit the folks who were ill or sick at sometimes, he would sometimes go barefoot as a way to demonstrate his humility. So the Prophet saw some, uh, you can think of him as someone who's either all into something and not half 
uh, half uh, one foot in, one foot out. He, he was someone who was all in or not. And especially just seeing from the spiritual standpoint of uh, of this aspect of if, if you just have one sandal or not, just, just be someone who's completely present, be someone who is who is there uh, and be someone who is not uh, just just in, in, in two boats with respect, be, be someone who's completely present to uh, your situation. And then also just in the uh, eating with your left hand. Again, we, we emphasized that earlier to begin with the right, but this was also something the process and would, would encourage uh, the frequent use of the right hand for those things which are uh, which are good, which are permissible, which aren't uh, contaminating in any ways um, or uh, things that, that would pollute in any, in any sense. And so we see the Prophet would have this aspect to him, this, the, any kind of mannerism to be able to uh, demonstrate not just humility, but a, a, a kind of forthright direction with respect to how he operates and how he goes forward in life. Um, Anas ibn Malik also relates that the Prophet ﷺ would have his would have a ring, a silver ring. Um, uh, Ali ibn Talib relates that he has a he wore a ring on his right hand, and uh, Anas relates that the Prophet ﷺ would remove his ring when going to relieve himself. That ring would say it would be a silver ring that said uh, Muhammad Rasulullah. Uh, it's a very famous kind of image that many folks have probably seen. Um, with respect to the seal of the Prophet ﷺ, he would use that ring as well to stamp different letters that are going to different leaders and rulers and, and people around. It was kind of the signature seal that's that's put at the end here. And so uh, you have the Prophet ﷺ also just being mindful again when going to relieve himself, uh, removing his ring, not, not just the fact that it has uh, his name on it and it has Allah's name on it, but also just being intentional in that aspect that he's 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 wearing his ring on his right hand, but he's going to relieve himself and uh, to clean oneself, you use your left hand. But still, the process of some uh, understanding and 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 giving this aspect of uh, total presence to one situation, to to being uh, all in and not just being kind of haphazard about conducting oneself with respect to purity, with respect to um, one's manners, with respect to one's conduct, to be uh, wholesale in with respect to um, how, how one conducts himself. And so just seeing that interesting parallel that even though the Prophet had a ring on his right hand, he still removed it and he still um, would give it its respect. He would be mindful of that aspect uh, when, when going to relieve himself. There's another hadith by uh, Uthman ibn Affan that the Prophet or that Uthman ibn Affan would uh, wear his izhar, his, his loin cloth, a, you know, this cloth that goes be below your waist. And, uh, you know, it's just like a sheet that, that is worn there that he would wear this uh, izhar at uh, a mid shin kind of level and um, would say that this is how the izhar of my companion was, meaning the Prophet Sallallahu And the, uh, again, the izhar is like a loincloth, which is like a sheet uh, wrapped around the waist. And um, it was related of the Prophet Sallallahu that he would not wear his izhar below his calf, that he would have it like right, right at his calf level and he would encourage it to be as such. But um, he, he, it gives us an idea as well of just his clothing that the Prophet ﷺ didn't own much, didn't have much, but also when he would when he would have it, he would wear it in a very specific way. Uh, again, in a way to instruct other people, but he would he would not just do it for the sake of just doing it, but also uh, give certain blessings or give certain invocations as to why. And so when he would wear his garments, of course, it was to encourage modesty and whatnot, but he would also uh, emphasize to his companions of what would be permissible and what was disliked. Abu Huraira, Abu Huraira relates that I never saw anyone when he talked about walking, that I never saw anyone who walked faster than the Prophet Sallallahu It was as if the earth itself folded up for him and we would tire ourselves, speaking about the companions, we would tire ourselves out in exertion, but for him, it was effortless. And similarly, Ali ibn Abi Talib relates that when he walked, when he walked, he walked with a vigor as if it, he were descending a height. So you have the Prophet was someone who walked with determination, with purpose, um, but also was very much, uh, get, you know, about getting to his destination. I imagine the climate at that time is not forgiving, so you probably don't want to linger around and kind of just, you know, uh, slowly get to where you're going. But the Prophet was someone who walked with a purpose, and this was something that his companions noted was very distinct about him, that it, he walked, but it was as if he's going down an incline, even though he may just be going, uh, you know, on a level a leveled street or a level way. Additionally, uh, another Sahabiyat, uh, Tayla bint Makrama, 
said that uh, she saw the Prophet Sallallahu in the mosque sitting in a kurfusa position um, and sitting in such a humble and tranquil manner that when she saw him, she was overcome, just like it, awestruck in a sense. And he was just sitting very simply, very humbly that uh, a kurfusa position is, is like if I have my knees just up to my chest and I just have my uh, arms around my knees, like you see so many people maybe sitting in the mosque, uh, waiting for Salah or just kind of sitting there after Salah, um, just kind of just kind of sitting there and you see the process of his, his, his mannerism of, of just kind of being in the mosque but not taking up full space not being someone who's at the front at the center demanding all the attention he just had this habit of just kind of just sitting there and just uh, just being very humble very tranquil very peaceful but also just just very modest in in, in his sitting and in his uh in in his mannerism with respect to being in the mosque uh, another sahaba uh relates that uh was, was uh, jabir ibn samura he relates that the prophet ﷺ was also someone who would recline on a cushion that he wouldn't eat when he would recline but he was somebody that would like to recline that when they would be having uh discussions when they would be talking uh the prophet ﷺ would also be engaging with them and sitting on a cushion and reclining but if he had to convey a certain point if he had to talk about something serious he would get off of the cushion and he would make his point very distinct but otherwise you can just imagine that if he's in a discussion or if he's uh, sitting together with some companions that he would be uh, relaxed. He would he would be someone that uh, would would enjoy comfort. He would not deny the comfort that would be able to become to somebody with respect to if it's coming in a halal and right way of coming about. But he was someone who who liked to relax. He was someone who liked to enjoy and and be able to be a part of the crowd um, and and converse. But he wasn't someone who uh, necessarily need to dominate the space. He was he was just somebody who who, who enjoyed to be be there. Uh, and be a part of it, but he would have a, a specific way of being intentional and being mindful of how he is there. So he wouldn't be someone that would lecture from, uh, you know, being reclined, or he wouldn't be somebody that would eat and kind of look sloppy in a sense. But he had a purpose for reclining, and that purpose was so that he would be comfortable. But when he had to uh, either eat or when he had to make a point, he would remove himself from his his recline and he would uh, engage appropriately. Another. Uh, aspect of the Prophet ﷺ that uh, his companions noted was that the Prophet ﷺ would lick his uh, fingers three times or three of his fingers, depending on the narration, after eating, um, showing that that one should not waste food. So you can see, and and when we say licking the uh, licking his fingers, he it wasn't necessarily with respect to putting one's finger all the way in one's mouth, as you might see some people just in a sense of licking their food. But it was in a very respectful and distinctful manner, where you'd have the food and he would just kind of clean it off uh, with the tips. But it, it it was something that is not. Um, that, that that would not be seen as just kind of like, oh my gosh, like what, what is happening here? But the process of is doing it with respect to uh, appreciating the food, but also making sure it doesn't go to waste. Uh, but this was a habit of the process of to either, um, you know, uh, clean off the food uh, with, uh, with respect to his three fingers, the um, thumb, the index finger, and the middle finger, or if it's three times with respect to uh, these fingers. So it's narrated in a few different ways, but uh, just general gist that the Prophet would not waste food, especially if it was a food that he liked, that he would eat, eat of it, he would take of it, and he wouldn't waste it. If it was food that he did not like, um, he would leave it to the side or he wouldn't, he wouldn't touch it. And so he, he wouldn't waste food, though, and intentionally would not engage in that. Uh, it's also narrated uh, in, in respect to food that uh, Umar al-Khattab uh, relates that the Prophet said uh, to eat olive oil and to apply its oil on you for it comes from a blessed tree. So again, we talked about the Prophet putting oil in his beard, putting oil in his hair, um, but to also just have this habit of uh, consuming olive oil, of eating olive oil, but also uh, of, of, of applying it regularly, that this was something distinct um, that the Prophet would do and, and make a point of doing. Uh, Anas also relates that the Messenger of Allah uh, liked uh, thufl, which is the uh, remains of a meal, the kind of the leftovers, the baglers, whatever is kind of at the bottom of the pot. Uh, the Prophet would, would enjoy kind of taking that and, and gave uh, high praise for uh, that that food that that remains. And so seeing the Prophet was not just someone who would race to take his portion before anybody else would serve. We know the process was somebody who would serve others before himself. Um, he would take food that was nearest to him, not farthest, and he would, uh, but he would, he wouldn't rush to take all the food to make sure that he gets it. Understanding again, the context of the time, this is a time that uh, you have 
very scarce portions. You have a very uh, unforgiving kind of climate that's there, but still the Prophet would uphold this ethic of uh, moderation and of respect for everybody else. And so uh, we see the Prophet would encourage just, or would himself take part from the leftover of the food or take part from what is remaining there, uh, but wouldn't make it incumbent upon everybody else that, hey, you can only eat what's left over. No, he would just, this was just his habit to, to do this. Uh, another companion relates that the uh, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam lifted up while uh, in respect to a gathering with respect to eating that mention Allah's name before eating. Eat with your right hand and eat from that which is nearest to you. So again, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has this habit that when you're eating with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when you're with him uh, gathered, you can expect that his his mannerisms at that table are amongst the parts of, you know, giving food to other people first, of serving others before himself, of uh, you know, taking what's nearest to him is also starting with the name of Allah, is also eating with your right hand. And it's also just taking what is near you and not, uh, you know, going above and beyond, but starting with that which is nearest to you. Um, the uh, companion, uh, companions, uh, this one uh, also relates here, and uh, Abu Sa'id al Khudri relates that when the Messenger of Allah would finish his meal, he would say, a supplication and he relates that he would say that all praise is due to Allah who has fed us and who has provided us drink and made us Muslims that he would be intentional again think about sitting with the Prophet Sassam. We're, we're sitting with the Prophet Sassam in, in this food uh, in this gathering of food and he begins in the name of Allah and he ends in the name of Allah and he, he's very intentional with how he's with food and again like I said I can't stress it enough to think about how the Prophet Sassam would have been in and how, how the, the climate was at that time, how this time was where food is a scarcity and that when it's provided, they wouldn't go all out on it like hyenas. They wouldn't go and just tear up the plate. They, he, was, he was someone who demonstrated moderation, but also demonstrated a uh, very attuned presence to being with uh, the food and the meal and uh, very, very cognizant of his creator when doing so. Uh, it was also related that the messenger of Allah would eat miscellaneous fruits uh, with, with fresh dates, that he loved fresh dates, and he would keep that um, with uh, any fruits that he's eating, whether watermelon or anything like that. He would have fresh dates with him. Uh, it's also narrated that the messenger of Allah instructed to uh, generally instructed to drink uh, water while sitting down, but there's some exceptions that were made at times. So it's some uh, narrations of him drinking while standing up uh, when he was drinking Zamzam, for example, but generally he would sit down when he would uh, drink water. Um, Ibn Abbas relates that when the Prophet, Prophet would drink, he would drink, uh, but he would pause to breathe twice or he would blow into the vessel. Um, he, would, he, would, he wouldn't guzzle down uh, any water. He wouldn't take anything down um, without kind of like stopping and whatnot. So you see the Prophet as somebody that even when they're drinking, even when he's just kind of has a, uh, has, has, you know, some water to quench his thirst, he wouldn't just you know, go all in mindlessly and then and, and just, you know, just quench his thirst and just kind of sit there. He, he would he would advise someone to take moderation, to drink a little bit, to breathe, to drink, to breathe. And, and we see the health benefits that are associated with something like that, as opposed to just, you know, uh, taking something down, binging something down. Um, but uh, to take things in moderation was was a prime uh, way of operating for the process of uh, Anas ibn Malik also related that uh, in, in regards to the Prophet's hygiene, but the Prophet had never refused uh, oil or never refused any gifts like pillows or perfume, and that the Prophet had a perfume um, and he would apply it on himself. Again, he was very mindful of uh, other uh, other people in a sense of, of, uh, of, of making sure that he doesn't offend anyone or that he's not a burden on anyone. But again, he's also very mindful of what uh, he has been given from Allah and how to take care of this body, how to take care of oneself best, especially in the community of others. And so he would use perfume uh, regularly and he would he would make sure that he wasn't somebody that uh, had be or somebody that, you know, you, you would uh, be repulsed from. Aisha relates that the Messenger of Allah would not in his speaking, he wouldn't draw out his speech. He would he was someone who would speak clearly. 
He would speak lucidly and he would space out his words to where anybody who sat with him would remember what he said. So thinking about how the Prophet's mannerisms are with respect to his speech, that he would point with his whole hand. He would repeat something three times uh, so that he could be understood as Anas relates, that he would say something uh, and he would convey it, but in a, such a clear way that whoever is in that gathering would remember what he said. And it's no surprise that we have such a vast and uh, such a dense hadith collection from so many different narrators and so many different chains. Uh, it's no surprise that this is even a science and, and body of work and tradition within Islam because of how the Prophet was that when he would speak to a gathering, when he would be with people, he'd convey himself in, in such a clear way that people would be able to take away uh, what he said and, and be able to remember it uh, mostly. And so you have uh, Anas again saying that uh, it's a mannerism of the Prophet to be able to also repeat something or repeat uh, a, a word or, or a phrase three times so that it may be understood if it needed clarification and that I Aisha relating, he would say it in a measured manner. He wouldn't speak just, you know, uh, and just blast something out and just people are unsure what happens. He would make sure people understand what he's saying. Uh, the uh, grandson of the Prophet Sallallahu Hassan ibn Ali, uh, relates that the uh, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu would point with his whole hand, that when he is uh, directing towards something, he would he would point with his whole hand. He would not just, you know, single out one, one, one. Um, he would point with his entire hand uh, if he's indicating something, which is very distinct. Um, when you see someone turn with something, you usually see people point this or point that. Um, the Prophet Sallallahu would gesture with his entire hand. And so, um, again, intentionally, you, when you point at something, sometimes, uh, especially at a person, it, it, it makes them feel uh, somewhat insecure sometimes, and it may give off the wrong message, but the process was someone who uh, would always invite with an open hand, with his whole hand, um, and, and you kind of see the, the, psycho the psychology behind something of, of that sort. You see the process of being narrated as uh, turning away when he was angry, that when he would get angry, he would turn away. He wouldn't try to just uh, erupt into the situation. He would be someone who would show his displeasure, not by you know, stooping to the level where he's yelling at someone, he's sh shouting or whatnot, but he would, he would, he would uh, you know, uh, show his, disguise his anger by um, just turning away. He would show his displeasure in that way. Now, when he would laugh, uh, his laughter was mostly smiles. He would mostly smile when, uh, he, his, uh, when he would be humored and when he would laugh, but uh, if he would laugh, uh, it's narrated that it was as if hailstones appeared. So you have like, like these, uh, you know, just, just, you know, just blocks of snow that these snowballs that that appear that you have um you know just this these hail uh this hailstones that, that you could think of white hailstones just appearing um when the process someone would laugh and then that in, indicating his teeth and and the whiteness of his teeth that when he would laugh he would he would make it known as well but his laughter was mostly smiles um that he was neither coarse nor demeaning in his speech or how he would talk or in his presence that he would not speak without need. These are things we've talked about in the past, but think about the mannerism of this person you're sitting with. He wouldn't feel the need to speak unless uh, something uh, needs to be addressed. And he, he wouldn't, uh, if he needed to correct something or if he did need to speak, he wouldn't come across as someone who was coarse or demeaning. Um, he would begin and end his speech by mentioning Allah uh, in the name of Allah. And so you have this intentionality that doesn't just go to the dinner table, but is in every aspect of the Prophet's existence. Uh, and a Sahaba lifts up that I never saw anyone who smiled more than the Prophet. So you have uh, this aspect of smiling that's so much so in his part and parcel of his behavior that it's a mannerism of his. That's something that he just does, that he smiles, that um, he, he would be someone who would uh, not be seen without smiling at least on occasion by, by the companions. Um, Abu Hurairah re re relates that the Prophet ﷺ was lighthearted with us, that uh, he was lighthearted, but only in truth though. He would joke, but he would do so truthfully. Um, he wouldn't tell lies. He would be someone who would tell honest jokes. He would tell jokes, he would be humorous, but he would be, be sure to do it honestly. A lot of times we see jokes being made, see humor coming uh, often at the expense of other people, but oftentimes with the stretching of the truth or maybe even just an outright, outright white lie or so. Um, but he would do so humorously, but he would do so truthfully in that way. Um, he was somebody who would appreciate poetry. He would often cite and quote uh, poetry 
um, that 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 was that was produced by the companions um, that was positive, but he was someone who had an appreciation for it, and he would show this, uh, especially when other companions who would uh, chastise one another for reciting poetry or anything like that, and uh, if it was something that was appropriate, the Prophet ﷺ would defend them and say, no, let them go on. Uh, in his masjid, he had a pulpit set up for uh, Hassan ibn Thabit, who was the Prophet's poet, and had that pulpit set up so that Hassan could uh, recite poetry that was empowering for the Muslims who are empowering of uh, the message of Islam. Uh, another companion relates that the Prophet ﷺ would go to bed with his right hand under his, his che right cheek and he would say, oh Allah, save me from your punishment on the day that you resurrect your servants. So this aspect, again, this mindfulness that uh, transcends, but when he would sleep, he would sleep with his right hand under his right cheek, um, and he would have this aspect of remembering Allah frequently. And we see uh, at the time uh, and, and, and sleep that the Prophet ﷺ, before he would go to sleep, he would recite so many other things uh, narrated by the companions, whether it is, you know, the three quls or whether it's Ayatul Kursi or Surah Mulk, all these different things. You have a connected dot that the Prophet ﷺ would uh, sleep and have a, a, a habit of uh, reciting something at night uh, that would connect him back to Allah, that would, that would give the praise to Allah, but that would be something that allows him to connect with his faith. Uh, in a very well-known tradition, Aisha relates that the prayer of the Prophet ﷺ at night was one that he would read at times that his feet would swell. And she would ask him, you know, why are you praying when Allah's already forgiven you? And he would respond that shall I not be a grateful servant? So this manner of just being always in prayer, this habit of being in prayer and um, in, 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 in his worship so intentionally that uh, people would say, what, what, why are you doing this? And, you know, you're, you're someone who is distinct. You have the message. And he's someone who would say, no, like, you know, I am, uh, I, I also need to show my gratitude. Um, I shall also relates that he would fast for so long at times that we would say he's constantly fasting. And when he would abstain from fasting for so long, we would say he doesn't fast. So seeing how the Prophet ﷺ would be very intentional with his practices, but he would, he would be someone who would do something to an extent um, and 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 people would would become thinking that he this is this is how he's doing, but he would, he would they wouldn't see the bigger picture of how he is operating. Um, the process of would intentionally observe fasting on Mondays and Thursdays. Um, his uh, his uh, his wife Aisha relates that the most beloved actions uh, uh, by Allah are those that are done consistently. And that the Prophet were, was someone who always consistently did his deeds. He was someone who was consistent and continuous with his deeds. Um, and this was something that was distinct because a lot of times we may give up something, we may stop doing something. And so that's why they were very uh, thinking much, thinking with respect to like, oh, he's fasting and I guess he's not fasting anymore. Or he's uh, fasting now, so I guess he's fasting, but oh, he stopped, so he's not doing it anymore. But they started to see the larger picture of when he would fast, when he would do some things um, and, and become accustomed to the deeds that are done consistently, but also regularly um, and moderately. Uh, another Sahaba relates that the Prophet would when he would recite, he would do so in a clear, measured tone that was letter by letter. So his habit of reciting was one that people would be able to hear appropriately. They wouldn't have to kind of close their ear in and, and try and focus on. They could hear it very measured and they would be touched very, very strongly by it. You would oftentimes also see the Prophet weeping in his uh, in, in his recitation, but also the Prophet was accustomed to weeping very much uh, and, and very, was a very emotional person uh, regardless when people would share difficult stories, when he's, when he would experience loss of a companion or of his own family member or, or of his uh, you know, children, he would uh, show this, uh, his tears and his grief and weeping very openly. And this was something that uh, people were not accustomed to seeing, especially from a man and thinking of what masculinity was and defined or thought of at that time and see how the process of challenged some of the more toxic elements of that and that concept. And so we see last time we talked a little bit about the, uh, the humility of the process of or in the previous sessions, we've talked about the humility uh, and, and it, it goes without saying, as we can, you know, kind of sum up this part, how the process of would have this habit of just staying humble, but also invoking it upon other people um, to, uh, to not build him up, to, to not go praising him in excess like, uh, like that was done to uh, Jesus, salam, that he would visit the sick, he would attend funeral processions, he would ride on a donkey, he would accept invitations of slaves, um, and he would speak only of that which would concern him. He wouldn't uh, take a seat at the front and say, this is my seat. He would take a seat where he could find in a gathering. Um, he would accept any gift or any invitation, even uh, if it was something very modest. So again, thinking 
thinking that this was something people marked that the Prophet ﷺ was by. He was a humble person. He uh, showed humility that this was uh, part and parcel of him. His character was also un unmatched in this aspect that it was distinct when people came and asked him about, uh, asked his companions about him. Companions would relate that he would speak about worldly matters. He would speak about food when we talked about food. He would talk about the world when we talked about the world, but he would also talk about the religion and faith when we talked about that, that he was somebody who met people where they were. He would turn his face, as Amr ibn al-As relates, that he would turn his face towards the worst of people and speak directly with them. And he would do the exact same with people who he loved. So this manner of being present to everybody and being present to anyone who's there, even if they weren't so much deserving or worthy of it, that Aisha related that he was never lewd in his disposition or in his behavior, that he wasn't boisterous. He never struck anybody with his hand outside of jihad, and he never struck a woman or he never struck a servant. Um, Anas relates that he never stored anything for uh, the next day. Anything he would have, he would have it for that specific day. And uh, Qatada relates that the Prophet ﷺ was shyer than a virgin in her quarters. When he would dislike something, you would see it on his face. He wouldn't, you know, uh, go go up and about and like be rambunctious about it. He was somebody who was very modest and very shy. And so as we close out uh, our session today, um, I know we've stretched kind of what mannerisms are. Somebody might say, oh, mannerism is just, you know, maybe I, if I have a pen and I'm just like spinning it uh, in class or I'm just doing this, but you see the process of mannerisms transcend just certain habits that we might think of ourselves doing like, oh, hey, I have this habit of waking up at this time and then uh, I do this and then I do that and that's it. But the process of mannerisms transcended his uh, entire lifestyle, his entire being and his entire day that was with respect to he had distinct things that he would do in his worship. He would have distinct things he would do when he would go to sleep, when he would wake up, when he would interact with his companions, when he would be sitting in a gathering, when he would just be with himself, when he would be sitting in the presence of people, or in general, how he would conduct himself and how his character would be. All of these things he had specific mannerisms for. And each of these things we can try our best to try to model in, in some way, shape, or form and try to uh, you know, replicate in our in our spaces. Um, but but just knowing that the process was very distinct and a very exemplar human being, and, and that these things that he was doing are not just one-offs, that he was doing these because these were his mannerisms. These were how he was, this was who he was. And so we we want to try and do as much as we can to be like the Prophet ﷺ, but we also recognize that the Prophet ﷺ was who he was because of these things that he did and because of the fact that Allah uh, chose him and appointed him as the uh, Rahmatul Alameen, as the messenger uh, that is the mercy of all humanity and all creation, but also as the perfect example. So as we close, we pray that uh, Allah makes us people who walk alongside the Prophet Sallallahu that continue to walk alongside the Prophet Sallallahu that in noticing these mannerisms of the Prophet Sallallahu we pray that we are able to take on something, even if it's a little change, uh, based off of what we hear about the process and based off of what we know and what's been reported about the process and that if we're doing something uh, differently now uh, that that isn't what the process some would be doing that we pray that we're able to at least change that uh, in a direction that would be in light of what the process some would do and that we uh, shape all our habits, all our intentions, and all our modes of being to be as if the Prophet ﷺ was to do them himself. And so, inshallah, until next time, uh, we'll be talking about uh, more specifically the diet of the Prophet ﷺ. What did the Prophet ﷺ like to eat? What was the food of the Prophet ﷺ that he preferred as related in the Shema'il? Uh, and inshallah, we'll go from there. But Jazakallah khair for being here, uh, wishing you uh, a blessed day and uh, looking forward to being able to connect with you all uh, and continue to discuss the life of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam.